good. Okay, good. Nice. And yeah, good. And we're recording. Welcome mm -hmm. to the Self Publishing Roundtable podcast, episode number one hundred and seventy-one. Today we are interviewing. Oh God, so many authors. Um, <laughs> let's let's welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I am Erica Conroy, and my beautiful co-host today is Krishan Callahan. Hello, Hello all. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're joined today by um, a few of the authors from the Pearl Harbor and More Stories of World War Two December 1941 anthology series that was released last month. Um, and since the 7th of December is a, a, well, an important anniversary of sorts, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, we thought this would be an excellent time to interview these authors. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to author R.V. Doon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. <laughs> You're welcome. And um, I'm probably going to mangle everyone else's name, um, but I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> uh, Marion Camaro, is that right? Yes, perfect. And I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Awesome. And also Robin, uh, Robin, uh, I'm just going to call you Robin Eccles because I'm not too sure about the middle name there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Hi. Yes, it's Robin Hobush Eccles. Hobush Eccles. Awesome. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies, to our humble podcast. And, Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Okay, uh, now we've read your stories from the anthology, Krishan and I, and we are going to have a series of questions, and since there's so many of them, we will try to address each question to you by name, so we don't all end up talking over each other. Now, um, I want to start off um, just to, to address all of some questions to address all of you before we get down into the nitty gritty of each story, but since this is a s historical anthology, how accurate do you feel each of your stories are? Can we start with RV, please? I work very hard to make it accurate, but we're going back in time uh, for me into 1941 in the Navy, and they use a lot of slang terms that they don't use currently. So it's, it's been a little difficult picking that up, but I work very hard to keep it accurate. Mm -hmm. And do, do you feel like sometimes you have to sacrifice accuracy for plot or vice versa? Ooh, sometimes it seems like that, but I try to make the plot workable in the extent of what's going on in the history. It's, it's really easy for me in this story because World War II is breaking out while the, nurse is, the nurses are returning on a boat back to their ship. And so they get to see it sort of live eyewitness to the war starting. So it's been pretty fun in that, from that extent. Awesome. Um, jumping over to RV, um, so how accurate do you feel, same story, questions for you, how accurate do you feel your stories are and did you have to sacrifice accuracy for plot or vice versa? You just spoke to RV, did Sorry. you want to? Sorry, okay. sorry, I meant Marion. I am really bad. I just woke up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, my story is uh, purely invented, invented, uh, but it could have happened that way. So I tried to research. I do have, uh, I live in Germany, I'm German. So I do have many letters and I still have relatives who lived during that time and I can ask them questions and I hope that everything that I write is very historically accurate even so the story itself the plot of course is not so you want to make sure that the story while fiction itself is very true to the times and the thoughts of the air yes I'm pretty sure that it might have happened like that or similar Okay, and, and Robin, what about for you? Yes, mine is set in California. It's set in a locality not far from where I live. 
and one reason I chose it is because I could do the research. Uh, it is not about, it. some real people are mentioned, the founder of the colony. Um, it's, it's about the Yamato colony, which is a Japanese immigrant colony. Um, the founder of the colony and a few uh, national or, or international leaders are mentioned, but my t and the characters are entirely fictional. However, you know, as far as attitudes, as far as locality, I've really made an effort to make it as accurate as possible for the time. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for all of you ladies in this kind. <laughs> I'm trying not to make it either a long one or like 15 in the, in, the, in the same order. But as I'm reading through these, I noticed that these are maybe short stories or tangent, tangential to your main, um, your main series. Uh -huh. Do I have that correct, ladies? Somewhat, somewhat. I got the cart before the horse. I wanted to write a short story my intent was to write something longer a full novel that would eventually involve some of my father's story this that had nothing to do with the Amato colony however I wanted a short story for this and I chose this topic well now I really want to write a series because the story of these people really needs to be told right and that was Robin and um, RV um, my story in the book, Deadly Liberty, uh, is an introduction to a historical mystery drama. Mm -hmm. And uh, Connie Coco Collins is a Navy nurse on board the U.S. Uh, as Solus. It's a real ship that was in the harbor yes. during the war. So, you know, mine is an introduction to a, a series that's going to be probably six books long. Right. And, um, oh, that's weird. And Marion? Yeah, mine is, um, it's an independent story. I I got that image in my head and then I wrote the short story around that little scene that I had in my head. And once it was finished, then because readers like it and I also do like it, I made the connection to my other series. So mm -hmm. the main person in that short story meets the main person of the other series. So. I really like to connect those stories, but you could have them separately. All right, then. Now, I wanted to set up that context because here's the real question I had when I heard about this. I am 44 years old. I have been reading about World War II since I could start reading. I'm like, <laughs> seriously, books, video games, movies, if it had, oh, the entire History Channel here in the United States, if it had Hitler or Pearl Harbor or anything concerning that, I was I was consuming it. And there is a lot there. Yes. Why? <laughs> There's a whole lot there. Um, what is it about what you write, and I'll ask each one of you in order, that keeps you, number one, interested in writing a subject World War II that is just absolutely saturated um, that you believe stands out from the ocean of fiction and nonfiction on the subject and that keeps your readers engaged. Uh, let's start with Marian. Okay, so I don't think uh, this genre is saturated, at least here in Germany it's not. Mm -hmm. and. My initial mission was to write down the stories of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, they fought in the resistance, in the German resistance. And that's the series I'm writing. And then I got to meet all those wonderful authors who are, some of them are here. And we planned this um, collaboration, the Pearl Harbor and more. Mm -hmm. and. Then I got the idea for my story, Turning Point, mm -hmm. and um, Margarete Rosenbaum, she's a German Jew, and she's about to be sent to a labor camp, and she overhears her employer that she will be sent away. And then I'm trying to show what's happening with that 18-year-old girl when she knows and how she reacts and then what she's doing, what she's thinking and 
of course, uh, in a story happen things that may not happen in real life. She is um, saved um, by a bomb. And then she has to make some really tough decisions. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's the line I want to hear. She was saved by a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Y'all need to read this and find out how, because she truly was. So Y'all need to read it and see how exactly how that was. Because I'm reading, I'm like, that's not something you see every day. So, <laughs> <laughs> RV, I'm going to ask you the same question. Well, I feel like history, especially for World War II, is starting to pass into the mist. And so people who are interested in history are starting to pull it back out. Mm -hmm. And to make it live, you need to give it give a reader a character who actually is living the event. It's one thing to read about Pearl Harbor, but it's another to get it from a viewpoint character, I think. And th that's what I'm trying to do is bring in all the things that were important to the people on that ship and what they handled. It's specific to taking care of the wounded right then, right there at that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't fly all over the island, you know, and what's happening here and what's happening there. It stays very specific to this medical uh, group of people on a totally modern hospital ship. It's got all the equipment of a land-based hospital on it. Mm -hmm. And it's what they were overcrowded, overrun with casualties. Right. And I just love that you put, you, you built a cozy mystery and a procedural together and you put it on a ship. Yeah, <laughs> a ship. up until very recently, I think you could tour. Uh, no, no, it was scrapped uh, just a few years after the World War II, but it was built from a, a passenger liner, which, which they called the Iroquois line. Yes. So it's pretty familiar to people when they look at it. They think they've seen it before. Mm -hmm. They built a lot of ships, but they came out late in the war in 44, 45. In 41, yeah. there was only one, Solus. Oh, so I just, I just <laughs> love the research that comes from this. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm about to seriously fangirl because <laughs> it's just like no seriously because once you get into a subject and then you just listen to people just tell all of what they know about this, I'm just like, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you like it. But putting so putting a woman on a ship in 1941 is hard work. Oh yeah, I was I it 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 was interesting how it was done. Like I said, it still felt like it felt like somewhere between a procedural and a cozy because they're it's self-contained. It was like Law and Order, 1942. <laughs> That's how it felt to me, and I was like, I really like this. I'm oh, sorry, going oh, on. Thank you, um, <laughs> Robin. Okay, what really started me in my interest in World War II fiction was family history. I oh. started trying to research my father's information. I knew that he was a navigator on a B-24 Liberator in Europe. But you know, like most veterans of those wars, he did not tell his stories. He would every now and then drop a snippet, but he would not discuss what actually took place as far as combat. And so when I went to try to write a history for him after he was deceased, of course, as a young person, you never think to ask parents these questions. So you know, it's like, all oh, right, I know these little stories, but what did he actually go through? What was combat like for somebody in his position? And so I started doing actual, you know, historical research at that point. Same for my mother. She graduated from high school towards the end of the war. She ended up in San Diego working as a switchboard operator. San Diego was a big, big, big naval base. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it was, was all very, naval base. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I ended up living in San Diego for the first years of my life. After the war, my parents moved us down there. So, um, you know, I was familiar with San Diego. So, yeah, that, that sparked my interest in World War II because I wanted to write their stories. I didn't want that forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so then, when, but when I, like I say, for Pearl Harbor and more, I needed something shorter. So then that's when I looked closer to home and realized here's another whole group of neighbors that need their story told too. And so then that's when I started looking into what they in, um, went through as far as World War II. Mm. And, you know, the being, being Japanese American. Right. And it was some, that was something that honestly I didn't know until I was in my teens. 
And I'm serious, it's not something that's taught in school. And it was not, yeah. it's not something that, it's something you hear about and you think somebody is joshing you <laughs> until you actually, no, seriously, until I went and visited my family in the Inner Empire. And then we went to the San Diego Zoo. Like you said, it was a really, it was a big naval base, Coronado and all that surrounding area. And then talking to folks in there, like, yeah, that actually did happen. And there was one over here and there was one there. And you're like, your mind kind of explodes because it opens up a whole different narrative. Mm -hmm. And I really liked how you handled um, Hirohito, is that, is that correct? Yamamoto. Yamamoto. Yes. Um, here he was the emperor during the time. Sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, was, yes. Uh, he, he, was was... Bookends, he was bookends to my story. Mm -hmm. And the thing, what I wanted to point out then is you need to, you know, realize as I was growing up, I mean, I, I lived with somebody who fought in World War II. And we, you know, anything that was said about Pearl Harbor when we studied it in school, it was like, the Japanese came out of nowhere and for no good reason just mm -hmm. bombed Pearl Harbor, you right. know. Well, we may not agree with their reasons, but Japan had their reasons. And it did involve uh, political decisions made by the United States government that the, the, you know, the average American citizen was not privy to. And so that is something that comes out in my story that after they learned that Pearl Harbor was bombed, it was, the outrage was, is, how could they do that? We didn't do anything to them. How could they do that? Well, from their point of view, yes, we did do things. And for, they felt that for them to continue, they, they, had to, they had to take the steps that they took. And so that was something I also wanted to bring out in my story. Right. And I just loved how even and how... How even and how... I don't want to say fair, but how... He, it is, this is not a twirly mustache um, villain. This is not one, it's three dimensional, how three dimensional these sections were. And face of something that was really hard on our history. And I think that was just done brilliantly. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna th toss it over to Erica. Really? Now I'm startled, yes. <laughs> uh, startled deer in headlights. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Because I, I get to talking, and if I just keep talking, we're going to we're going to go into a bunch of different areas. But um, okay, so while she while she figures out what she was going to ask, <laughs> I want to know how did this? Um, who set this? Who set up this anthology? Okay, my tongue don't want to work now. Who set up this anthology, and how did you guys meet one another? Or this is the first time where you guys are actually meeting. We met, uh, we, in, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> we met in a Facebook group, actually, and um, two persons came together to set up the Facebook groups, which is the Second World War Club, which all readers and writers of World War II uh, and World War I fiction um, can join mm -hmm. and discuss topics. And there we met, and then I think Rachel and Diane. Diane has a story mm -hmm. also in the anthology. They organized the whole thing. So it was their idea. Oh. And so you guys were familiar with one another. I won't ask you this question, and this is going to put you on the spot. And, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I'm interested to see uh, what you will answer. And I'm, we're going to start with um, Robin for this one. Other than your own story, whose story are you really liking in this anthology? Because there are a lot of different points of view and a lot of different types of stories here. Oh, that's a tough one, because now yeah. you're, asking, you're asking me to make animes here. <laughs> oh, it isn't like that. We're just asking, no. what about saying that, that, okay, to our audience, I'm going to let you know this, there is not a stinker in this series at all. You have your genre, you have um, your literary drama, you have a little bit of everything, and they're all top notch. So I'm not asking her which one stinks. I'm not asking them which one stinks because... Oh, no, 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 they aren't. Uh, I, now, Diane was not in, 
invited to this. I enjoyed her story. I've read some other stories that are related mm -hmm. to her story. Uh, Robert Kingsley's story, um, that had a lot of information which was new to me. So I found his story very interesting. It set in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, what was going on in Singapore and how, you know, what happened when they met up with the Japanese. I also liked RV's story very well. I always enjoy stories about uh, wartime nurses. Uh, and, you know, they didn't, they never really received the recognition they probably deserved. And uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed reading her story. And of course, Marion's story I also enjoyed very much. And uh, so, um, simply because those were my personal interests, but they were all good. I mean, the, I really, and it's so varied. I mean, there is something for everybody's tastes in that story, in that anthology, I should say. It really is. I'm like, there's even a con story, if you can believe that. A con man <laughs> heist story. And, I've, and I read that, I was like, yes, because that's my guilty pleasure. But <laughs> on to, <laughs> we're going to move on over to RV. Oh, who... I mean, which one of them did you just really read and go like, wow? Uh, I really like the con man story by Alexa. That's hers. I, I thought, my gosh, I don't know if I even like this guy. And then as you went in the story, you, you find out he has a, a very big heart and it's Christmas season and he and he shows his softer side. And so you want to know what happens to him in the war. I mm -hmm. uh, also uh, like Mer uh, Robin's story about the Japanese internment. I had written another book called The War Nurse. And it was about the German Americans getting swept up in that FBI dragnet, just as the Japanese and the Italians did. And so I was very interested in her story as well. And I really liked um, the way Marion took a chance and dropped a bomb on her character. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and she survived it. And and I thought, you know, sometimes sometimes a stroke of luck does happen. So I, I also too like. Um, uh, Diane Ashcroft's story. Uh, I've just recently come back from a trip from Ireland, and she really has a way of, of bringing in the feeling of the Irish people into her stories. And then by taking it back to World War II, uh, I like the way she introduces her her characters and brings you you in. And I felt like when I was visiting Ireland, I knew it from her book, kind of. But um, I, I love all the stories in the book because they all show a different viewpoint uh, other than Pearl Harbor what was happening while Pearl Harbor was going on. You tend to forget that the world is a very big place. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, what, and, the, and the ripple effect of something as, this is a monumental thing, but the ripples may show itself in very subtle ways rather than, oh my God, it's a bomb, and oh my God, everything is on fire. <laughs> And I love it when writers think about those small ripples and those subtle and those subtle changes that things like this make. What about you, Mary? Okay, I, I'm a romantic, so I <laughs> love the <laughs> Margaret Tana's story about the, the sailor who died in Pearl Harbor, who meets his uh, true love uh, I, 75 years later. And yeah, the oh, time travel, I, yeah. I really liked that one. <laughs> <laughs> I liked all the other ones too. Um, RVs uh, with the nurses. I actually kind of have a love-hate relationship with that one because it, it just stopped in the middle and I was like, hey, why, why don't you just go on writing? I mean, you can just stop right here. <laughs> I did go on writing. It's finished. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's, that's good news because yeah. I was really like, no, you can't do this to me. <laughs> oh, I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, that's exactly what she did. She's like, oh, you can't stop writing? Watch this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, yeah, just. Yeah. But oh. it's good that she has finished the book because now then we can read it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, you are welcome. Mm. So I am going to take a, a moment to breathe and collect myself. Erica? Um, so we've talked about the book, and um, but 
but how ha how do you market a, a historical fiction these days? Who 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 are you marketing to? Oh well, there, there's a set group of people who who love World War II fiction, and they are very avid followers of the genre. But it's hard to market in the mar in the general population right now. I find it incredibly difficult for myself. But an anthology is one way to market to get a group of authors together who market in one certain area, like we have. I think that we're helping ourselves by doing this. For exposure, I mean. Mm -hmm. Does Does anyone else uh, want to yeah. weigh in on that one? Yes, I do. This is uh, Robin. Um, one thing that is really great about this anthology is our authors come from all over the world. We have one author, um, Margaret, uh, from Australia. We have a couple of us from the United States. We have one in Northern Ireland. We have several that, uh, one's a Canadian living in Europe. We have a couple of the others that live in Europe. So these viewpoints come from all over the world and the marketing goes all over the world too. Um, We've tried to make them available in as many nations as possible. There are a lot of people who love reading historical uh, novels, and it doesn't really matter. They're, they're not set necessarily in, in one particular genre. So you get a lot of crossover. That's I mean, right. So what I, I mean, I have been writing for the historical Western romance audience, and I find that there's a lot of them in that audience that are interested in World War II. Even though it's a, almost a decade late, or, or not a decade, a, you know, a century later, they enjoy it because it's historical, and because it's about real people in difficult situations. And so, um, but we've used a lot of social media to market, and plus some of your paid sites. Um, but I think, I think mainly working with our existing reading audiences has been one of the things that has helped us the most. Awesome. So what kind of advice would you have for me or Krishan or, or anyone else who's interested in getting into writing the historical fiction genre who haven't before? Well, if you don't mind, <laughs> if you don't mind me speaking up again. No, not first, at all. First, uh, read in your chosen genre. If you, are, if you want to write World War II, read World War II books. Okay, second, do your research. If people read a lot of books about that time era and you don't have your facts and figures down, you making glaring mistakes, they will pick up on it. You will lose your credibility as an author. So make sure you do that. And also, this is one of my biggest complaints with some people that try to write historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Write characters that are typical of that time period. Don't try to put a 21st century New York millennial in an 1870s Kansas cow town. It's not going to work. Oh my, he gets, oh, he'd get his behind beat. <laughs> well, you know, people read that and say, that's just not real. And then you lose all your credibility. So that's my two cents and I'm passing it on to the others. <laughs> Well, this is this is RV. I'll just say that it's it's very hard to create a spunky female character in a world where men dominated, uh, especially on a navy ship. It was their world basically, but you can f make her curious and you can motivate her and you can give her a helper, a sidekick who can go below decks and and help her find what she wants. But my advice to people would be to narrow your focus as much as you can to a certain place, a certain time, a connection that you have uh, in some manner. It, it could be even a family story and then focus in that one area because it is such a wide topic that there are many, many stories that have yet to be told. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be my advice too, that um, you write what you know. So for example, Robin, she writes about that um, Japanese community which is near to where she lived. So she knows the area. Or I write about people in Germany because I know the Germans. So then it makes it all a lot easier because even though, of course, you are out of that period and have no idea how it really was back then, you can better understand how some 
I can better understand how a German person feels like a Japanese. I, I probably cannot understand them very well. So it's really, really easier to write in your region or in your family or whatever your profession. If you're a nurse, you write about nurses. Um, yes. So what I'm picking up here is that keep it small and compact as much as possible. Know what you're talking about. And for the love of all that's good and plenty, do not put modern day sensibilities into a historical character. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> And, and, yeah, unless you're time traveling. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget, we have a time travel in this in this anthology. Yes, but then that's different. It's 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 it is literally a millennial going into <laughs> another time, right. not uh, not a bunch of folks who um, who have always been in Kansas from 1837 to 1901, and yeah. all of a sudden they're talking about laws and yellow. Right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people forget that people weren't very mobile. Uh, they become very mobile during war. They are transferred all over the world. And, you know, a lot of people who never left their community were in Europe or, you know, in South Pacific Islands. And so that's one of the interesting things. They Some of them change when they get to a new area. You know, they, they grow. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's a lot of folks in my family, they lived in a small town um, near the Swiss border, and then they came to the United States and stayed in Kansas, Hayes, Kansas area, and then the war started, and all of a sudden they started to travel. They'd only seen these two places their whole life, and then <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden they're continental. That makes me cool. All right. Um, this is the part we're about halfway into our time with you. And so we wanted to get to know a little bit more about you as individual authors, because this is well, truly not just about the anthology, it's about um, what you're writing um, as well. So let's start with Marion. And aside from what you're doing for this anthology, can you tell us a little bit about your universe and the books you write? My universe? Yes. And ah, okay. your, your sure. books. Yes, sure. So I um, have one trilogy about, um, it's called Love and Resistance in World War II Germany. Mm -hmm. And it's actually it's based on the story of my grandparents. So it's a real story. Of course, I have fictionalized it. So it starts in 1932 and spans uh, a decade over the three books and and follows them on their life and and how life in germany changes for ordinary people how even the most normal or how do i say average person gets um prosecuted, uh, gets discriminated, um, mm -hmm. your neighbor can rat you out if you say something bad and so on. So this is this atmosphere of, of fear, of um, living in tension all the time that follows them throughout their lives. And of course, for them, it's a lot worse because um, they actively joined the resistance and, and worked against uh, the Hitler government and uh, they sabotaged um, the war production. So they were in constant danger of being caught and uh, put mm -hmm. into jail. And, and this is uh, what I write about in my other series. And it takes place in Berlin, the, the capital of Germany. Mm -hmm. And the story for the anthology also takes place in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And there I you wanted to ask something? Or? I wanted to ask just a side question. Are these originally written in English or in German? Which market were these originally for? Now, I write in English because it is much easier for me to write in English than to first write in German and then translate. Mm -hmm. So I have the plan to do them in German as well, but 
first I have to finish the third book and then I will see. <laughs> <laughs> what do you find is the major sense you're writing it in English? And I just assume that um, English speaking Europeans and Americans are your audience. What do they find the most, ex um, most unexpected and endearing part of your stories? What uh, many people have told me is that they had no idea how the ordinary German people lived and felt because um, it shows exactly how life, daily life is for them and how um, the government starts creeping into every corner of your life, taking over, making you having to adapt to their ideology. It was mm -hmm. once said that like everyone had to think the same, to look the same, to be the same. There was no, nothing diverse was allowed. People who looked just the slightest bit different, like the Jews, many mm -hmm. of them looked a little bit more Mediterranean. They were just like, oh no, that's bad. The good thing is this and everything out there is bad. Mm -hmm. so, and people had to adapt to that ideology to survive. Right. But that wasn't the prevailing thought in the day-to-day -day life of a German just going and going to work and raising kids and taking care of their house and things like that. No, they were just, I think they were, many of them were careless. They were just kind of like, uh, yeah, that's the way it is. And I'll just do what they say. And it's not that bad. And you know, and da, 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 and it got worse and worse and worse. And then it was too late to do something. Okay. Wow. So people just, of course, there were many that adapted and believed in the ideology, but many were just kind of indifferent and did it because it, no, there was nothing better to do, maybe. Right. You know? mm -hmm. So the silent majority. Right. But, but what I wanted to show is that there were people who actively resisted and tried to to save the country and they couldn't right that sounds that's just amazing audience ladies and gentlemen please read this anthology it is so good robin tell us a little bit about your universe the book series um <laughs> <laughs> You're giggling already, already. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it and about um, your series so far. Okay. Uh, first of all, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. I I've loved to write, read and write all my life. But what really got me reading and and I mean writing this time is my love of um, family history. Right. And I, I get, the problem was is when I would do genealogy, I'd get so caught up in the history of the times that I was researching for my family that I'd get distracted from, from the names and the dates and the places. Right. So that's what led to my writing. Um, I write under two names, my own name. I have uh, two, they're kind of time travels that I've written that, that go back into historical United States or North America. And then it's also set partially in the future. And then I had, then I started writing under a pen name because, you know, the advice I had received is when people see a certain uh, name, author name, they expect a certain kind of book. And then that's when I started writing more historical novels. Uh, and actually one that I wish I had published under my actual name is Family Secrets. It's published under Zina Abbott. But Family Secrets is, covers three generations. But the third generation, or the oldest generation, Grandpa Mike, was a Vietnam War veteran. And I based his stories on my husband's own Vietnam War experiences. And so that was how I helped preserve his stories. But then I've also, under that pen name, written several uh, historical Western romances, including a series set um, in Eastern California in 1884. It's called Eastern Sierra Brides, 1884. And it's a set of novellas uh, set, you know, during the gold rush days of that time. And then, um, you know, and other than that, then I'm, I'm back under Robin Eccles. And like I say, I do have a series plan for World War II, once again motivated by my desire to share some things I've learned as a result of my family history. But it's, I, I just love history. And I, I love to write stories based 
on the past. Um, what is the one that if, what's the series that, um, the story or the series of the book that if anybody wants to start reading you, which one should they start reading first? If you enjoy time travel, then I would say get the Aurora Rescue series. Okay, I've got two books in that. That's under Robin Eccles. If you enjoy historical Western romance, I would start uh, with Big Meadows Valentine, which is the first book in the uh, Eastern Sierra Brides, 1884. Um, if you like, like Family Saga, um, that goes back a little in history. Uh, it's not. So, it, it's a little bit of romance, but it's 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 more about some of the challenges that can be found in family life, then I'd say Family Secrets, under uh, uh, published by Z as Ina Abbott, with, with my, and that's my pen name that I use for that, uh, Family Secrets. And, um, and otherwise, yeah, you know, look for my name. And I, I'm, for World War II, I am using my maiden name as part of my author name to distinguish it. And in fact, one uh, element of my story in Pearl Harbor and more is the Caucasian girl is named Flo Kaufman and her father was a first generation American her who parents immigrated from Germany and that my father has you know has a surname German surname and yes as soon as there was a war he received flack because of his German surname even though his own father fought in the Great War right Okay, but you know, as soon as something like that comes, anybody who has anything about them that others consider suspect, either their appearance or a surname that belongs, to, you know, from a nation that is now the enemy, mm -hmm. even though you are an American citizen, were born here, you become suspect, and that is such a challenge for people. Right. And so that uh, that's why I chose to include my maiden name. When, when I write my World War II novels, to set that apart from the other books that are different in nature. Right. Thank you so much. RV? Well, I never Tell really meant... <laughs> I never really meant to write about nurses after working with them for years and years, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for some reason I did. I started out with the Cozy Mysteries with a, a nurse who was burned out and a family secret popped out and she started investigating it. And I think it was because mostly as a nurse myself, if something went wrong that wasn't expected with my patients, I would try to figure out what happened. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the clues, I, I guess you could say. So I started with my cozy mystery series and then I did some medical thrillers. Uh, I've got one out now and I'm fixing to go with the next one blindsided for the medical ther thrillers. But then when I wrote The War Nurse, I realized that I wrote it because of comments that one of my patients made about his father. He could take the pain because his father had been a prisoner on Bataan. And, you know, it made me go back and look at it. And so I, I wrote The War Nurse and it took a lot of research. So I'm combining my love of mysteries with what I've researched in World War II. And I'm coming up with a Coco Collins, you know, Navy nurse series on board the USS Solas. And so mm -hmm. she's going to, the ship follows the, the Marines as they move through the South Pacific. And so that's what she's going to do. But she will have to get off the ship uh, once or twice. So <laughs> I'm going to do that tomorrow too. Oh, oh goodness. So um, what is the first book in that series? In, in the World War II series? Yes. Uh, it's it's the one I've completed, but it hasn't gone through editing yet. It's called, I've called it a couple of things, but I think I'm going to go with it as Infamy Shadow. Okay. And uh, because there there's a murder in the midst of all these heroic deaths, it's kind of, you know, an odd thing to occur. And maybe it even did, for all I know, but uh, I like <laughs> Infamy Shadow. Right. So I, I may go with that, but it might change. But that's going to be book one. All right. After, then. after Deadly Liberty. All right, then. And I'm going to um, back out a little bit out of the World War II stuff and talk about your other books as well. What do you want, to, what do you want once they've read um, about Coco, what's the name I just, it doesn't fail to make me smile. Um, <laughs> what do you want them to go on and read next? Well, uh, I would like for them to read The War Nurse if, if they're interested in nurses at war. 
So that's one of the reasons I'm writing uh, as I am. The war nurse is about a nurse who gets stuck on uh, in the Philippines during the war. Mm -hmm. And then the Connie Collins, she's going to be moving through the war. So I'll, I'll probably do spinoffs off that series, too, of, of the nurse characters she meets on ship because they get detached at, you know, after 18 months or 12 months, they move on. So I'll move some of them through in different parts of the, the war. But I'm not there yet. So all I have now is the cozy mysteries of the nurse who's uh, basically just in current time. And the medical thriller is also in current time. Oh, wow. Thank you, ladies, so much. We have about 10 minutes left in this. And we are going to get a chance for you to plug your sites and plug your mail list addresses and everything. But before we go, um, have any of you have any any of you been to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana? No, I haven't. That would be Robin. Robin Eccles. Right. No, I no, I haven't. RV Marion. Uh, I'm going to it uh, very shortly. I did go one other time, but they had delayed the uh, opening, and so I didn't get back to it. But I, I'm planning on going. Okay. No, Man? I haven't. It's it's kind of far away from here. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Germany. I understand that. Go ahead. I understand that, but I never take that for granted. Because if you ask me, have you seen the Antiquities Museum in Cairo? Yes, I have. Twice. And so <laughs> yes, never... I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, you no, never I know. No. But I have been, I, I live in Munich, which is yeah. very near to Dachau. Yes. And there's this concentration camp memorial. Mm -hmm. And I've been there like at least five times and it gets to me every time. It's such a, even today, it's a harrowing experience. Mm -hmm. And I can only recommend to everyone to go there mm -hmm. or to any other of those museums. It, it, it really helps you put into perspective things and, and hope or do your best that Things like this will never happen again. Right. And that leads perfectly into my question. For those of us, um, those of us in the audience who know little about World War II, or for our kids, or for what would be the one thing that you personally or through your fiction you would want people to remember about World War II? Let's start. Um, Let's start with RV. Hmm. I don't think people realize just how tragic it was. Um, you know, you hear about it being called the Good War and, and that kind of thing. There was an incredible amount of suffering going on during that war. A lot of upheaval. People lost their homes, their families. It, it was very hard. It's, it's really amazing that the world recovered as it did afterward. And uh, I, I hope we never go back to a, a war that bad again, because the, the, they still are revising the death numbers. And, you know, I, I, I want war to be a, become obsolete, basically. That would be my goal in life. I would like to see war become obsolete. All right. Marion? Yes. Basically, it was, it's, I think, not imaginable for us today maybe you can compare it with something like in Syria happening right now on a mm -hmm. smaller scale I was just in in Ulm this weekend and they had this little memorial thing and it said that one night uh, the Allied bo dropped 96,000 bombs on that city in half an hour 55% of all the buildings of the entire city were destroyed. 25,000 people, which is, was about half the population, was um, homeless after that night. So this is things, it's really so horrible. I mean, we, no, we, just the imagination, having this happen again, we, we cannot let this happen again. We have to be vigilant and peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. There we hope. Uh -huh. Yes. Robin? I I see the the messages of World War II in the form of 
prejudice and discrimination. That's mm -hmm. what my story in this book was about. And uh, as much as it flared up during the war, it was there before. And mm -hmm. that was a lot of what set people apart, the, you know, trying to look down on others and not see them as, as valuable as themselves or their own government. And um, I think that if we're not careful, that we can let uh, our prejudices against other cultures, other nations, other beliefs, interfere and lead to something like this again and that needs to be prevented i i agree with what marion said you know the devastation of world war ii was was terrible and even after people went home and rebuilt those who fought in that war continued to suffer a lot of them the rest of their life they felt that they had to keep it inside them but it affected their mental peace that affected their families it affected their lives until they died uh i know it did my father he didn't talk about it, but I know it, it, it took its toll. And so that is the lesson, is we have to prevent something like that. And because the, the earth just does not need that kind of a scourge. Mm -hmm. mm. I think it's I think it's good to recognize the heroism and the and the bonding that goes on between people in these harsh times, which I, I, I try to bring out. But, you know, in general, a diplomacy is far better than warmongering, <laughs> in, yes. in my opinion. But yes. then we wouldn't. But it's also that one thing maybe there was, well, of course, from the German side, we started the war and, and all those horrible things with the Holocaust happening. And if the other countries uh, would have interfered earlier mm -hmm. so it's always good to to be vigilant and and keep your eyes open you yeah. never know what would have happened but just trying to yes uh take half your eyes open and and see where discrimination happens and and put up your voice and say no this not with me not where i live right I want to thank you ladies so very much for taking the various hours out of your schedule to talk to us about this extraordinary and absolutely wonderful anthology. It was a fun, fast read. A lot of it stayed with me and my reading life is a bit better because this anthology is in it and I won't say it again, ladies and gentlemen, y'all need to read for Homer and more. And that is thank available. You, you're welcome. It is available on Amazon, and um, it's available on Amazon. It is, um, I believe, it's ninety nine cents currently, and it yeah. will be a very good dollar you spend here, um, ladies. Before we go and before we wrap up, can you tell us, um, remind us what your names are and where people can find you and where they can sign up to your mailing list once they read this and they want to read more from you. Um, let's start from um, from my right. Um, Robin? Yes. I Probably the, the best way to get to all my links would be my blog. It's Robin Eccles, R-O-B-Y-N-E-C-H-O-L-S dot mm -hmm. blogspot dot com. I've got links to my books, I've got links to my newsletter, and you'll find links to my, my website and my other social media sites. So, robinnichols.blogspot.com. All right then, RV? Uh, mine's easy, rvdune.com. That's, wow. uh, that's my website where everything is. <laughs> that is very easy. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Marion? Well, mine is easy for me. Uh, it's kumaro.info. It's uh -huh. K-U-M-M-E-R-O-W.info. And that's my blog and website. And on there, you find the links to Twitter and Facebook and whatever there is. <laughs> <laughs> all the social medias and all the information you need. All yeah, right. Instagram and Pinterest and, uh, you know, all the social media. Right. All right, then. Erica? I just wanted to um, 
thank you ladies as well um, for taking the time out to be on the show and um, for also writing those stories, those wonderful stories in the anthology. So thank you. Thank you. Erica. Thank you for having us. And I yes, just want enjoyed to add, it. <laughs> I just wanted to add for those listening, uh, a reminder that the self-publishing roundtable is closing this year. Um, uh, we are sad oh. to go. And, <laughs> <We're so> sad. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're sad to go as well. But it, as we've said last week, um, it's we feel it's time. And from the ashes of Spurt will rise at least three more podcasts um, regarding self-publishing and similar. Um, also, our last episode will be on at the usual time on 15th of December. And if you want to see Chris Fox again, um, check in an hour earlier. Awesome. Yes, it is. And our website is selfpublishingroundtable.com. Thank you. And what do we say to the lovely folks at home, Krishan? Good night, Internet. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>